in the lane, 15, 10, touchdown, Chargers! What's up, guys? Welcome in to another episode of Chargers Weekly. As always, joined by Matt Money Smith. Money in the Midwest for some March Madness. Yeah, it worked out. Um, did the IU Michigan game on Sunday out in Bloomington, so flew in to Indy on Saturday afternoon and was able to connect with our friend uh, Lance Erline, who I worked with for a long time covering the combine, and uh, a couple scouts, a couple GMs got to hang out with on Saturday night, chop it up about the combine, and then Sunday called the game. And uh, after the game, ended up having dinner with our our colleague and friend Daniel Jeremiah and. More scouts, more GMs, talked to some coaches that uh, were kind of floating around the hotel, a bunch of old NFL Network colleagues. So it was kind of fun. It was almost like I was able to get some good combine because you learn so much at the combine. You know, a lot of it's off the record, but at least it kind of gives you an idea. Um, I'll tell you, I, I didn't think I went to bed on I went to bed on Sunday night um, or maybe Saturday. Yeah, I went to bed on Sunday night thinking Derek Carr was going to be a Jet and uh, and woke up and he was a Saint. So. It's kind of funny, you know, speaking to just maybe how kind of close and tight that was and, and you see just how it's kind of put the league on its head and and how desperate the Jets look here on, at this moment when we're recording this podcast to, to get Aaron Rodgers, you know, basically sounded like and talking to some people like, yeah, it's it's an A or a B. It's, it's Aaron Rodgers. It's Derek Carr. It's got to be one of those two. So I don't think I'd be surprised um, unless, of course, Aaron doesn't want to go there. I won't be surprised to see them really put together a pretty – um, substantial offer to get him out to New York. It sounds like they really want to make that happen. Yeah, the, the full court press has to be on there. And then you mentioned Derek Carr out of the AFC West now in New Orleans. And then this whole Lamar Jackson thing is wild too because he's going to have the ability to kind of shop himself around the league. You're seeing teams that say they're not interested, which I find to be kind of funny because it's Lamar Jackson, an MVP. Yeah. Uh, so where where is Lamar Jackson going to go? I think between Rodgers and Lamar, we'll get to all the extensions with Burrow and Herbert, but those are the the next two dominoes, no? Yeah, so, you know, I heard a couple different things, you know, and and nobody's ever being honest with you. They know I'm in the media. They may want me to to put out there what they're they're selling. I always am cognizant of that. Um, But I heard kind of two different theories. One, that teams are reluctant to engage with Lamar because they're convinced Baltimore's going to match that that's all this is. It's why they put the lower tag on him because they are just beating their heads against the wall, you know, with what he wants and what they think is realistic. And they're just content to let the market set itself for him. Um, now that doesn't mean that a team can't put together an offer that Baltimore deems is, you know, too expensive and they'll take the two first round picks. But that's sort of the impression I got that that they just feel like this is a waste of time, that yeah. whatever they put together for Lamar is going to be matched and he's going to be back in Baltimore. And this is just an opportunity for them to say, hey, man, we're not trying to screw you over. We're not trying to get one over on you. Go out and see for yourself what we think is a fair deal for you. And no, we want you. You know, we're, we're going to match the deal. Like we, we have no interest in seeing you leave, but this is an easier road than putting the exclusive tag on at 45 million and just continuing to butt heads. The other thought is that teams aren't going to be as interested, that the number's too big, that they're concerned about the injuries, um, that, you know, well, why would you trade two ones to go up and get, you know, Anthony Richardson or CJ Stroud if you're the Colts? You know, why trade four and a future one and a two and a future two? to go get Stroud or Bryce Young or whomever when you can just trade the two ones and get Lamar. Well, one, because C.J. Stroud isn't going to cost you 50 million bucks a year. And two, I think there's there's some legitimate concern about, just like there was when he came out, just like there is with Bryce Young, you know, that quarterbacks that are light, you know, it's, it's a concern. You know, it is a concern when you're at that number you know, under 200 and whatever, 10 pounds or 15 pounds. I don't know what the threshold is, but I think there's some legitimate concern about, A, we get rid of two draft picks that you kind of need when you have a $50 million quarterback. That's how you have to build your roster out with those draft picks. So now those are gone. And, and, you know, B, 
here's a guy who's missed, you know, four or five games in each of the last two years. Um, and is that because of his slight build? So it'll be interesting. I know for a fact, look, I know if it were me, and I know there's people that are pro Lamar and people that aren't sold, um, I'd take the flyer. You know, I'd do it. If, if I were, no. you know, I'd, I'd be all about it. I'd be like, man, you want me to give up two ones and get a guy who's 26 who can do what he can do? And, like, if you have a good offensive mind like Arthur Smith in Atlanta, you know, I, I think the question, Chris, just becomes timetable. You know, like, to me, I look at the Raiders and I say, why the hell wouldn't you drop them in there? You've got Waller. You've got Renfro. You've got Devontae Adams. You've got Josh Jacobs. You've got Colton Miller. Like, to me, that's the one that I'm like, man, if I'm the Raiders and I'm thinking about giving up seven and maybe a future one to get up to number two or number one, and I would much rather just be like, here's the twos, here's the money, let's go. Let's let's get a division with Herbert, Lamar, Mahomes, and Russell Wilson and see what the heck happens. That's what I'm wondering, uh, buddy, is, is what are the Raiders going to do? Because with, with Carr leaving, that's like the, the one kind of – big piece in the AFC West that we're unsure about right now. Like, who is the quarterback going to be for Josh McDaniels? Is it going to be a guy like Lamar Jackson? You hear that they're maybe they're not as interested in Aaron Rodgers because of the, the fact that they don't know how long he's going to play. Um, right. the, the, the rookies in this class, I mean, and we, we can kind of start there because, listen, this, this is a position the Chargers have no interest in, but it does nothing but benefit them if four quarterbacks 100%. are going to go ahead of them, maybe five, who knows, um, you're back at 17 of uh, 17 overall again. So right. the, the the Lamar Jackson thing is fascinating. I think Deshaun Watson set this precedent that Lamar is not going to let people off the hook with. Like, hey, he, you gave right. him guaranteed money. I want guaranteed money, and uh, the quarterbacks behind me want guaranteed money. So I, I think that's the kind of the big sticking point too. Is is Lamar is asking for something that I don't know the Ravens are comfortable giving up at this point. Yeah. So I think. You know, look, I I know that, you know, we work for the Chargers and, and how does this, you know, do we, do we have a bias toward ownership and, and the front office because we're under their employ? Maybe, I don't know. But, but the way I try to explain it to people that just stick their feet in the ground and say selfish owners, why aren't these 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 contracts guaranteed? And, you know, and there's there's a couple things, you know, one and look, I, I've said it on this podcast before. I think the I think the owners hide behind it, the whole escrow thing. Like I, you know, you have to put a certain amount of money into escrow that is that is guaranteed. Now you can structure the contract where you don't have to put two hundred and thirty million dollars of Deshaun Watson's into an account immediately. You know, you can guarantee that money, but say it is guaranteed at this particular date, and then you can arrange that with the league where then you can put it into the escrow as it coincides with those dates. So you don't have to do it for 200 million bucks immediately. But that's, you know, to, to, to have $200 million of liquidity, it's not easy. Like you gotta have a certain amount of means in order for that to happen. I know these franchises are valued, you know, we're talking about the, the, the Washington Commanders at $7 billion, but yeah, that's not realized until you sell the team. Until you actually sell the team, you're still on operating income. And what does our ledger look like? And we know for you know from the ESPN reporting, it didn't look good in Washington, and that, that Daniel Snyder was uh, was pulling fifty million bucks out to, to the Linus pocket. So it's not like you have that money liquid. The second thing, and I think this is the more important part of it, is this isn't basketball. It's not twelve guys. It's not even baseball at twenty five guys. It's fifty three guys. And a practice squad, and guys get hurt. It's a violent game. You know, you sustain, we know it well as the Chargers <laughs> from last year, horrible injury luck. So you've got to build depth. So when you're talking about guys that are making an average of 35 to $50 million a year, the way you can build these contracts out gives you that leeway. So it's like, yes, I, I'm guaranteeing you 160 million bucks, Justin Herbert. You are going to get 160 guaranteed. And I'm going to give you 80 million dollars of it over your first two years or 90 million dollars. But the way it works is now you can build in that cushion so his cap hit is not like Deshaun Watson's with a fully guaranteed deal where you've got a number on your books for that year of 45 or 50 million bucks. 
Now that number can be 28. And for people are, that say, and we, we went through this with Popper last week, well, eventually you've got to pit. He's right. However, you can build it out now. Now it's like, okay, well, when that 53 million's due in four years, because Justin's only 28, now I can build it out. And I can make that 54, 36 again. And I can, while he's still getting his money. So that's what, you know, and, and in a situation like this, you can then build in, you know, you can build in protections for the rest of your roster. Where, okay, now I've got Joey making 30. Well, guess what? I can now dig back into Herbert's contract because he's not going to complain for me converting future salary into signing bonus that I can now stretch over three more years. Like that's why they like to tr structure these deals, particularly the quarterback deals this way, because it's a built-in safety for them where they can always deduct. You talk, I think you'd use the term last week, the bank of Bosa, right? So you can use those banks to take money out and help the roster out. And I'm not Look, you're worth whatever someone's willing to pay you. So I, I do not fault the quarterbacks or the players for wanting to get all this money guaranteed. They've earned it. They deserve it. You know, there aren't a lot of quarterbacks that can play this game. However, it does help the team out incredibly to be able to have a contract like Patrick Mahomes that's a half a billion dollars, but it's stretched over 10 years, and you can just pull and use a number, you know, to use a term that, that Popper used last week, could, could pull so many different levers to help your team out to, to negotiate that salary cap, that hard cap that they have in the NFL. It's funny, speaking of levers, I, I saw the, the Saints converted, I think maybe it was Taysom Hill or something, and right. I, I almost tweeted levers to you because that's right. what they do, you know? <laughs> Look, I know, I know Popper, you know, it was the sticking point between the two of us, and I'm not trying to have a one-sided argument with him not here to defend his position, but I told him, I was like, hey, let me know when it happens because every single year, and, and yeah, they had to let Teron Armstead go and they had to let Gardner Johnson go. Sure, every team has to do that, but they were 55 million bucks over the cap and somehow they signed Derek Carr to a $70 million guaranteed deal and he's going to be their quarterback. Now. Like It's just yeah. every single year they do it. And I, and, and I think for me, like I encourage it. I think it's great. I think if you're a Saints fan, you know, I don't care about future years. I care about this year. I care about this year and next year. And I want my team to win the division. If I'm a fan, I want my team. Like, I don't, I don't want my team. Like, like, to me, it's great for the fans. You know? Now, look, there's a flip side to that. And that's what the Rams are going through. The Rams were incredibly aggressive to win that Super Bowl two years ago. And they won it. And now they're really paying for it. You know, this is a team that is really getting torn down to the studs. And now with some reports about Matthew Stafford's future and how cloudy that could look, Chris, that's the one to look at. Like, wow, that's a team that really, Jalen Ramsey, Aaron Donald, Allen Robinson, Cooper Cup, Matthew Stafford, they paid these guys big freaking money, like six dudes. And now look at what they're dealing with. Now it's a real mess there because... You know, they just, they, that that's the one, not the Saints. It's the Rams that you should look at for like, oof, I hope we're not in that sort of situation. Yeah. They, they hoisted the Lombardi though. So again, it's like, okay, did, did they do what they set out to do? And were they aware that this was going to happen at some point? And how quickly can McVay build it back? You know, yeah. money, Rich Eisen had uh, Joe Banner on his show yesterday. Yeah. And he brought up a really, really good point about these guaranteed contracts. If you're in your mid-20s, like a Lamar Jackson or a Justin Herbert, there is a very, very high probability that you're going to see every single cent in your contract anyway. Like, it, it's just, it, yeah. it, it, may not, it may not say, hey, this is guaranteed money, but there is a very high probability you will see every dollar of that contract, and then you'll get another one. So. 100%. The, the, the fact that we talk about guaranteed money and, and kind of what the Browns did with Deshaun Watson, if, if you're in that position that Lamar Jackson is in right now and you continue to just be Lamar Jackson and don't change anything, um, you're going to see all that money. So I, I think that's an, it's an interesting way to kind of look at it. And these contracts, we're just – it's whatever the moment is. Daniel Jones is making more than Patrick Mahomes right now. You know, and that's just kind of what it is right now. But, you know, Patrick Mahomes will probably get another huge contract or restructure it or whatever. But this is the year that, you know, Kyler Murray got his last year. Daniel Jones got uh, huge money this year. Yeah. Uh, and then it's just going to keep going. You know, Burroughs next, Herbert's after that. 
and you know we'll, we'll see what happens in, in 2024 and, and who's up next. But each quarterback is going to benefit by the previous guy getting paid. And you know we we saw that with even with Derek Carr, who you know isn't a top 10 quarterback, maybe a top 10 to top 15 quarterback, top five, getting top guaranteed 15, money. Yeah. yeah, top 15. Yeah, and I think it's funny, Chris. I think like the. You know, Tom Telesco said it at the the combine. Well, Herbert's going to get done, and that, that that's that's an easy one. That that's not a hard one. That deal's going yep. to get done. They'll figure out how to how he wants to structure it, how the the Chargers want to structure it. He's going to be the highest paid player or the second highest paid player in the league. However, whenever it gets done, the more interesting one to me is Austin Eckler, who is in the last year of his deal. And I bring it up because you brought up Daniel Jones, right? Look what the Giants did. Look what the Raiders did. Look what the Cowboys did. You know, you're talking about guys getting franchised at the running back position, not getting extensions. How do you, how do you Henry, think Saquon feels getting $10 million and then seeing his quarterback right? get all that? That's what I mean. So, like, that to me is the more interesting one. You know, Austin Eckler, who has been a touchdown machine, who has been a bargain for this team, you know, that's the one that I'm interested to see how they want to work on that. Because when you're in the last year of a deal and you're a running back, we know that's when things start to get sideways at that position. We've seen it repeatedly year after year. So that's the one deal I'm looking at a little bit more as to how do you guys want to work this? You know, he's he's got with all these franchise tags, um, he's going to end up being again like the 8th or 10th or 12th highest paid player at his position. And how's that going to work out in the last year of his deal? And, and what are you what are you probably going to have to do in order to get this thing right? Because we know how important he is, how unique of a player he is. But we also know he's on a team that's 22 million bucks over the cap right now. So that to me is going to be an interesting one. Um, just because of how that how this league treats that position. And you think about the identity of the Titans and how important Derrick Henry is to what they want to do, the type of team they are. And it's like, yeah, go up, shop for a, shop for a new deal. We're, we're happy to, to let you try it. You know, Tony Pollard, no, nope, don't want you on a long-term deal, franchise. Saquon, franchise. Josh Jacobs, franchise. So Rashad Penny, I know he, look, he can't stay healthy, but he's an incredible runner. We know how important he is to Seattle and what they want to do. You know, go ahead, let's see what you can get on the open market. You can't stay, like, that's a different deal. Um, that's the one that I'm going to find that, that I find interesting as to how they're going to try to piece that one together um, and, and if they're going to have to piece it together. And, Money, that's, that's why we talk about a B. John Robinson because, you know, yeah. we're, not, we're not just looking at 2023. You're looking at three, four years down the line. And if you have an elite player at that position on a rookie deal – it just makes sense to, to bring a guy on because he can play with Austin and he can also carry the load on his own. So, like, yeah. I, I understand Popper's argument, hey, you know, never draft a running back in the first round. But if, if it's a generational guy, I think you have to think about it a little bit. And, you know, we also talked about, okay, well, if he's the final piece, then go for it. Right. Who's to say he's not the final piece? I mean, this this team was a Super Bowl contender. We we thought this team was a Super Bowl contender going yeah. into this past year, right? They they had injuries, but Ravaged they're going to get a ton of guys back. Yeah. You're going to get Slater back. You're going to get Austin Johnson back. Hopefully, Joey stays healthy. You know, we'll see what happens with Khalil, and and, and hopefully Khalil can do what he did this past year and play for 17 games. Um, yeah. Mike and Keenan. I mean, Justin was hurt all year. So who's to say that the the team that they currently have constructed can't get deep into January, maybe February, and then you throw a guy like B. John Robinson into the mix. So that, that's why I think that that position in particular is fascinating, and you have to think about the future with the running back position because of exactly how you laid it out. Um, these guys have a shorter shelf life. Um, the, the franchise tech, that's the one thing I want, I'm wondering in New York is is how happy Saquon's going to be because you, you know he all. probably wanted to see – how much he was going to get on the open market. Now he's not able to do that. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think for running backs, unfortunately, it's just the reality of of the position, of the, the market. And look, there's nothing wrong with getting 10 million bucks for a year, you know, or, and, and that's, this is where, this is where the conversation of a first round back, you could argue makes sense, right? So you get four years, you get the fifth year option, 
And then you can do two franchise tags. Let's say you have an elite back. You get four years of locked in salary from the first for, for, for being a first round pick. Then you get the fifth round option, which averages that. It's like a franchise tag, right? So now you got five. Now you got two franchise tags to work with. And nobody's paying running backs. Like to me, that's that's the argument. Or if you want to draft them outside of the first round, now you get four years and two yeah. franchise tags. So you get six or seven years, and then you get to the next one. Because it's just a, a position that takes so much punishment. Um, and I think that's where Austin is interesting because he's so different. He's such a different player than your standard running back and why his situation is unique and how they're going you know, to, to sort through that. Um, but just imagine you take you know, Robinson. Let's just say he immediately becomes one of the five best backs in the league. Um, you know, if you're projecting him to be what everybody thinks he's going to be. So now you've got an elite player. And that's what you're looking for, right? Do you have a player that is top five at their position? At edge rusher, Joey Bosa. At quarterback, Justin Herbert. At wide receiver, Keenan Allen. At, you know, left tackle, Rashawn Slater. At, like, at, at defensive back, you know, in the yeah. defensive backfield, Derwin James. Like, that's when you're talking about building a Super Bowl contending team, you need to have these blue chippers at positions. Well, now if you tell me I can plug in a guy at running back, and he's going to be one of the five best players in the league at his position, and I'm going to have cost certainty for five, for seven years. And it's going to be affordable, you know, because the franchise tag for running backs is $10 million bucks. It's nothing. So it's like, that's where that, to me, that's where that conversation starts to make sense and why it made sense to tag Hunter. You know, we know the, the, the Chargers don't tag a lot of guys. You know, they tagged Hunter because it makes sense to tag tight ends. Ten million bucks for elite for for someone who is as elite as Hunter, you know, like Gasicki last year. Done. Let's go. Bargain. Draft the tight end in the first round. Fifth year option. Franchise. Franchise. And there's seven years of cost certainty at a position that's not going to crush you when you drop that tag on him. Yeah, I'm with you, and I just I I I think we forget about Rashawn Slater and just how good he is. If you put uh, an elite back. Uh, again, I'm not saying Austin's not elite. Austin's just a different type of running back. Yeah. Austin has been awesome. He, he leads the, the league in touchdowns over the last two years. Um, but if, if you get... I a, do think, though, Chris, you know what I... Just to jump in, you know what I yeah. think? And you've got to find a speed receiver because you've got to open things up. That that, that was the pro, that was a big problem with the running game last year is just yeah. teams did not respect the, the downfield throws for someone that has arguably the best arm in the league. And... It's crazy. Like, they just didn't. And so that's how, you know, so that's something that has to get worked out. However they figure it out, they've got to figure it out. You have got to get speed in that wide receiver room. All right. Hey, let's take a quick break. We, we got a bunch of questions that uh, relate to the combine, the draft, and free agency. We'll answer them on the other side. All right, guys, as the official hospitality provider of the NFL, On Location offers unrivaled access to experience all premier NFL events like never before. On Location brings you up close for all the action, providing fans with unforgettable moments from draft day to Super Bowl Sunday and everything in between. On Location thrilled to announce its new partnership with the Pro Football Hall of Fame. This August kickoff football season in Canton, Ohio, and be there live to witness the class of 2023 enshrinement. The NFL is headed back to London and Germany for the 2023 NFL International Games. On location, official packages will feature game tickets, deluxe hotel accommodations, private tours, pregame hospitality, end-to-end -end planning, and more. Be sure to secure your priority access today. Visit NFLOnLocation.com or search NFL On Location today. Your football experience of a lifetime awaits only with On Location. So, Money, I put a tweet out. I put out uh, the bat signal this morning for, for Chargers fans to, okay. to ask questions about the draft and free agency. I want to just start with this one, though. Let's just get an origin story. How did Mr. Smith get his nickname Money? Uh, I wish it was a great story. It's not. Uh, I just worked on a, a morning show in Los Angeles, Hall of Fame morning show, Kevin and Bean. Um, got the job when I was still in college answering their phones and thankfully their sports guy took a liking to me 
and wanted to use me to do some voices and allowed me to kind of write some comedy for for them and and be able to get on air um that guy was jimmy kimmel so that was super cool to to have him sort of bring me in under you know, under his wing and kind of walk me through and uh still remains a friend to this day he's just one of the best people ever as loyal as anyone could ever be to his friends and that's why you see his show look the way it does with his Aunt Chippy and Cousin Sal and uh, Guillermo and his Uncle Frank, who sadly passed away, um, you know, and and, and uh, Cleto, who's been his best friend, who's his band leader, like that's just Jimmy. So he was nice enough to, to kind of take me in and uh, help me out when I was still a junior in college. And um, for some reason, the guys over there just gave me the name Money. I don't know why, because everybody on their show had a nickname, you know, we had lightning and we had big leo and i was money and you know you just that's just what it was that's everybody yeah had a nickname and and they gave me the name money i we, we've speculated why but no one's given me a good answer so i don't know if it's because i was gambling with cousin sal when he was coming by or or what but that's i wish i had a better story i'm sorry it's a be uh, but it's hopefully a the kevin best story pretty much jimmy kittle yeah. put you in a position to get the nickname money right i mean there you go yeah so pretty great <laughs> That's awesome. Pretty great. All right, Camp C4, yeah. that, that, was, that was your answer. Uh, this is from uh, Junius Lim. If, if we go wide receiver slash tight end in the first two rounds of the draft, who are the players that define Kellen Moore's prototypes? Well, I guess you, you look, look, the, the Cowboys have had some really good receivers. I mean, Gallup and CeeDee Lamb and Amari Cooper. and I mean, that's... You're talking about really good receivers. So I don't think there's necessarily a profile for Kellen Moore. Um, I think because you've already got Mike Williams, Josh Palmer, Keenan Allen. So you've already got ones. Like you could make a case that both Mike Williams and Keenan are ones. You've got a one and a one A, which very few, but which he had. You know, you, you could mm -hmm. argue that, that he had. When he had Cooper and CeeDee Lamb, he had a one and a one A. Um, and they were able to move off of Cooper you know, because of that, would I have? Heck no. Not for the number. I, was, I think he was making 18 million bucks for Amari Cooper. Absolutely would have rather have kept Cooper there than trade him for whatever it was, a four or a five from the Browns. But um, so I think any receiver could could fit in. I think, you know, if you want sort of the smaller guy that's fast, say Flowers, um, I, I, you know, I, I got a chance to watch some of the wide receivers. Man, I love Downs was so smooth out of North Carolina. Mm. That's a potential maybe second instead of a first Josh Downs. Dude, he is smooth. And, I mean, you talk about beautiful-looking hands. Um, Addison was super smooth, too. Now, I don't, you know, he tweaked that. I, I don't know if he tweaked a hammy or a calf or what it was. It was something going on that he ended up having to cut his workout short. But you could just see the fluidity in his movements. So, I think there's a lot of guys. You know, Flowers looked great. He looked explosive. I know DJ likes him a lot. Um what about so guys, Hyatt? I think you saw Hyatt with that street. So I think, I think we saw it, right? So here's Hyatt. He gets the Richardson throw um, downfield, and what happens? He drops it, you know? So that's a, a bit of a concern is that he's just, one, he's a one-year producer, and two, he's a one-trick pony. So I think that's the thing you have to be concerned about a little bit, whereas, you know, Addison was – Great last year, had some injury issues, and he's slight, and that's the one thing to be concerned about. I think he weighed in at like 171, so you're talking about a, a much smaller guy, a much you know, thinner frame that you maybe have to worry about a little bit. But, man, he was good at Pittsburgh. If you just go back two years and watch what he and Kenny Pickett were doing, it was so impressive. And I, like, I, that, I know the, the Steelers are probably the best drafting wide receiver team in the NFL. It's incredible what they come up with you know, in those second, third, fourth rounds. But... I do think there's something to be said about, you know, getting guys back together, you know, the way that Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase got back together, you know, the, the, the I, I do think there's something to that, um, you know, Devontae Smith and Jalen Hurts and so I, Jalen Waddle and Tua, you know, there's just something about that familiarity and connection. So I don't know if Addison will be there, but in terms of tight ends, you know, Dalton Schultz is... You know, I'd say he's more of a pass catcher at tight end as opposed to a you know full service big body can block his tail off. I think you saw you know Washington certainly play his way into the first round out of Georgia. Oh my I don't think God. there's any question that he's going to go in the first round. Right? You, you on saw the that one-handed catch. 
Yeah, on the sled, just, I mean, the sled is still crying for help. Um, so I think that's a real interesting one because there's not a lot of pass catching production there because they didn't need it. But the idea that you have a six offensive lineman anytime he's on the field that is going to be able to match with your defensive end and just obliterate your linebacker or defensive back is super intriguing. And it's just a question of, okay, how good is he in the pass game? How good can he be in the pass game? You know, versus someone like a Dalton Kincaid, who would be more like your Dalton Schultz and, you know, just exceptional. He'd be an upgrade on Schultz, you know, just a ridiculous route runner, separation. You know, we talked about it last week, you know, Travis Kelsey asked, you know, and you saw Mark, Mark, you know, Mayer, who's, you know, looked incredible. I mean, he was the body beautiful guy out there. You saw him all muscled up and, you know, looks like he's perfectly proportioned and it is kind of that, that signature full service tight end. So I think, I think in the, you know, I think you're more, I know that kind of the, the vibe that I got from people was that it's not as good of a wide receiver draft as you might like, and that it's a really good tight end draft. So I think along those lines, you're probably more likely to get a good tight end in the second round. And maybe you gotta, you gotta spend a little bit more to get the, the wide receiver. Um, or, you know, is it not worth the first round pick for the wide receiver because you feel like the tight ends are a little more talented. So why not go for the talent with that first round pick? It's, it'll be interesting to see how they, how they sort it out. But yeah, I would say there's a number of tight ends that you could probably say reflect a, a Schultz type of tight end. Um, you know, Mayor uh, Musgrave, super athletic, looked really good, body, beautiful guy. Um, Washington was just a, a, an alien, a complete alien out there. So that would be a, a real interesting one. Good problem to have for the Chargers selected at 17. Yeah. One of those guys is going to be there. You know, one of those elite tight ends or who knows if Addison drops. It's, 21, it's such know? a great point. I'm glad you, you brought that up, Chris. It's, it's a great way to look at it. You're not picking at 21. You're picking at 17 because yeah. there's going to be four quarterbacks. So now just set your O-line, D-line, defensive backs, tight ends, wide receivers, and the one running back. And there's six positions. You know, you're going to probably get the second best player at one of those positions. Yeah. You know, guaranteed because you're talking about 17 guys that are going to come off the board. Jermaine out of Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, how do you guys feel about us adding a guy like Miko Hardman? Would he come at a discount considering his injury? J Jermaine's looking for speed, money. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great. I think it's a great point. You know, is there is there someone on the free agent market? You know that, and, and you saw it last year. You know, you saw some of these guys that were floating out there that were speed guys that you take a flyer on. You know that that you hope pan out, and uh, you know, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. You know, and and look, Mikol is has not had the career that the Chiefs had hoped. You know, it's just he's kind of been a little more effective on those jet sweeps and stuff, and just really wasn't the guy that could take the top off. He would he would flash every now and then, um, but certainly that's the one concern, right? Is you've got Patrick Mahomes who can extend plays, who's got a huge arm should be a no-brainer, should be an absolute perfect weapon. And they were hoping that Hardman was going to take over for, you know, for Tyree Kill, and it just never happened. So that's the, I think that's the one concern I'm blanking. I'm, I'm, I'm vamping because I'm trying to think of the name, and why can I not remember the Notre Dame receiver that was in Houston that signed the one-year deal? Will Fuller. Uh, Will, Will Fuller. Yeah. Like, look what happened with Will Fuller, Fuller last year, right? Like, hey, here's this elite speed. Let's go get him. And then he just barely plays, and it just ends up, you know, so that's guys that are hurt tend to get hurt, you know, and there's a reason why guys with four, three speed find themselves on the open market. So that's just the one thing you got to be aware of. Why, why couldn't the chiefs make it work? Why do they have to bring in Marquez Valdez Scantling to be that speed guy when they already had McCall Hardman on the, the roster? And why did they have to go trade a draft pick for Kadarius Tony to do a lot of the things that we thought McCall Hardman was going to be able to do when they already had him on the roster? So that's the one I think concern. Uh, with that yeah you know someone else asked about Jalen Guyton uh, he's a free agent now and I, I think the silver lining to having a terrible injury like that is that it happened earlier in the year so may, maybe he yeah. could be fully recovered by the time uh, you get to the, the beginning of the season 
uh, is Jalen a guy worth bringing back? You know, he's 25 years old. 100%. Uh, you know, if if he can if he can still flash that speed, um, you know, you just you just hope that you know he can he can be close to the same guy that he was. Um, because when you have an injury like that, you probably do lose a little bit of speed. Yeah. Uh, at a league minimum deal, which is what I think it would be. Yeah, yeah. 100% I'd bring him back. Yeah. You're familiar with him. He's a great teammate. Guys love him. Great in the room. Herbert's got a special chemistry with him. We know there's been some sensational plays that those two have made together. Uh, I think when you're talking about filling out the backside of your roster, yeah, I, I would much rather have Guyton as a depth piece as maybe a couple of the other receivers you know, that they were carrying in that position. So that makes sense. Um, I'll be honest, like I'm, I'm really interested with how, how it's going to let it. I'm trying to figure out the best way to say this without kind of saying anything weird. Like I'm, I'm anxious to see if it's the same receiver room next year. If the, I just think about like last year, like the year before. So what do teams want to do with young quarterbacks? Right? Like, just look at what the Bills did with Josh Allen. They traded a one for Stephon Diggs. Look what the Eagles did with Jalen Hurts. They traded a one for A.J. Brown. You've got, you know, potentially a Houston team that's going to be drafting a quarterback. You've got a Colts team. You've got, you know, some a Panthers team. Now, they have D.J. Moore and stuff, but, like, I just wonder if, you know, if the Chargers are going to get calls, you know, if they're going to get calls because it's like, hey, you got two receivers that are making 20 million bucks a piece. Mm. Let's see if we can pluck one of them. Let's see if, you know, we can offer you a second round pick or something and pluck one of those guys and help our young quarterback out because you kind of have this embarrassment of riches of two ones, you know, which not a lot of teams have. And I think I just there's something about it that that's kind of been nagging at me, and I wonder if how you know when you're when you're over the cap, when you're trying to build out a roster, when you're trying to get depth, and you've had two receivers that dealt with injuries last year, but are really really good. You know what happens if you get that call? You know what do you do? Because we know the way those contracts are structured, they can move them. You know they and they're not going to take on a lot of dead money for either Mike or Keenan. So I. I I know what Tom said, um, but I think it's different from "Hey, we're just straight cutting this guy for cap relief." To you got you got Will Levis coming in, you got you know Anthony Richardson who's got a huge arm, and we want to pair him with a guy like Mike who can high point. We'll send. We got two ones. We'll send your other one. Let's. I, I, I'm interested to see how that would shake out. I'm not saying I would do it. Yeah. What I'm saying is. I, I think they're going to get that call. Uh, I would not be surprised. And I think that's when you not now you have to start saying, okay, if we do this, if we take this piece away, what do we replace it with? And look, you saw what happened in Tennessee. It totally fell apart. AJ was a Jenga piece and it absolutely fell apart. Um, so I, I think you have to be, you know, and, let, and then look what happened in Minnesota. They pull out digs and they plug in Justin Jefferson and, and they upgraded. Yeah. And, and so it's like, it works both ways. So I'm anxious. I'm anxious to see if if they do get that call and and what would happen if they did. We've seen we've seen stranger things. Uh, you know, remember last year the, the Cardinals tried to do the same thing with Kyler Murray. Let's get Hollywood Brown. Let's trade a yeah. let's trade a first round pick for Hollywood Brown. And the Ravens said, okay, go for it. You know, it didn't really work out. That's what I'm saying. Um, but they had Hopkins there too, so they were they were trying to just just load it up for Kyler. Um, right. Hey. It, I, and I now they're going to trade Hopkins. I wouldn't. Put, or he's a free agent. Yeah. Who's that? I said, and now Hopkins is going to be gone. I know. Like you know, he's he's on the market. So yeah. it's just a trend. People follow the trends, right? Look at what Diggs did for Allen. Look at what AJ Brown did for you know for for Jay, for Jalen Hurts. Like it's there's a reason why you know Doug Peterson went out and said, hey, let's get some vets down here. Let's get Evan Ingram. Let's get Christian Kirk. We got a young guy. We need to get veteran receivers yeah. to help him. Now out. they got Calvin Ridley. I mean, my God, it's like, crazy. Hey, you know what? I wouldn't put I wouldn't put anything past this draft. I, I think the Bears 
are going to do some wheeling and dealing. They're going to have a ton of picks. 100%. Man. They're going to have a ton of picks. 100%. A Chase Claypool isn't enough for Justin Fields. So I, I, I could see that was, yeah. I could see the Bears saying, okay, hey, let's go get D-Hop. Let's go look in the, uh, in the AFC, right. see who's available for our guy so we can take this offense to another level. So it, it's fascinating, and, you know, anything can happen. I, I think Joshua Palmer, the way that he played in the absence of Keenan and Mike, I, I think maybe showed the front office yeah. that, hey, uh, Joshua is capable. He's only going to get better. Uh, the way he works with Justin after practice, man, that that has just been a thing that we we've seen since his rookie season. So, who knows? Uh, how about uh, let's see? Gerard Robertson asked about uh, the time frame on Pipkins. I, I think people are are understanding the the Pipkins thing. Uh, among the unrestricted free agents, we talked about Drew last week too. But uh, getting Trey yeah, it's- back in the fold is important. We, you know what, we we ended up getting some really, and I want to try to find it here. Um, where the heck did it go? Um, you ended up getting a huge break on the the tackle market. Um, let's see, I'm trying to find. Here we go. I could not believe how many tackles did not get tagged. I thought for sure that you were going to see Orlando Brown get a second tag. Nope. So this is the benefit for the Chargers is there's a lot of tackles out there that are free agents. Orlando Brown, Jawan Taylor, Caleb McGarry, Mike McGlinchey, Taylor Lewan, Isaiah Wynn, Donovan Smith yesterday released by the Bucks, uh, Calvin Beecham, Andrew Wiley of the Chiefs. So, like, that's a lot. Like, if you're the Bears and, like, that's where, th- which we said, these guys never hit the market, you know, and yet here they are hitting the market. So that's where it could benefit the Chargers that, you know, maybe Trey finds himself a little bit further down in that pecking order because they don't know him like the Chargers know him and how he has developed and how he has gradually taken these steps to have his best year and to be a really good right tackle that fought through a lot of toughness. Um, and they wouldn't value him as much as maybe a couple of the other guys that have just had, you know, they were first round draft pick, first or second round draft pick. So they always have that stigma attached to them. They won a Super Bowl in the case of. Orlando Brown, they were the highest paid tackle in the league at one point, and Taylor Lewan. Like, they all have that sort of resume yeah. that's a little more flashing lights for these teams with a ton of cap space to go, you know, the Raiders to go out and get one of them, the, the Bears to go out and get one of them, with what we were talking about, um, that maybe it works out for the Chargers, or, unfortunately or, hey, for money, Trey. Or but, on the flip know. side, if, if somebody really falls in love with Trey and his youth and the fact that he's ascending and they pay him a lot of money, you just named a bunch of guys who could be right. potential replacements you know um, obviously it, it, it would be nice to have Trey in here and, exactly. and to just kind of continue what he started here with the Chargers but um, it, it's a great point because yeah. there, there weren't many tackles tagged and there's you know I couldn't believe Peter King Peter King I think in his column said that this was going to be a very boring free agency that's one position though where you just named a ton of guys who you know really kind yeah. of fit with the Chargers need uh, even like from a swing tackle perspective, if you can get uh, another guy in here to back up, I know I know we have uh, Sawyer in the mix. I don't know if they're going to move him to guard. Um, he's a candidate right. to be a swing tackle too. But um, I, I just think that that's one position the Chargers um, they could look at closely and say, okay, hey, let's get Trey back. But if, if not, there's a couple other guys that may fit the bill. No doubt. Um, I think if you ask them, ultimately they would probably prefer to get Trey. Um, as opposed to trying to figure out if there's an upgrade out there. But I think that benefits them. I, I think, you know, teams would be apt to, to lock in on somebody like a McGarry, a Taylor, a Brown before, you know, those. I'm talking about the teams with the big numbers in cap space. Um, they can go out and spend some serious cash as opposed to like, you know what, let's take the ascending player. Let's take the guy that that had a, a solid season last year, as opposed to someone like Donovan Smith, who everybody knows is just a rock solid league average tackle. Is he elite? No, but that's not necessarily what you're going to get in free agency. You're going to get, is he replacement level? Is he, is he one of the 20 best tackles in the league? One of the 18 best tackles in the league. If he is, let's go get him. Cause that's all you need. Uh, because, because to, to, to search for something else is foolish. It's just, it, it's so hard to find. Uh, but I think it ends up benefiting the uh, the Chargers quite a bit. Same with same with linebacker. You know, we were talking about Tranquil. You look at the linebackers 
that that are going to be available. Uh, let's see, where did they go? I was like, holy cow, look at all these freaking linebackers that ended up making their way. I had no idea, you know, how many of those guys ended up not getting deals. Bobby Wagner, Tremaine Edmonds, taking one pick ahead of Derwin James. Nope. They didn't pick up his fifth-year option. He's a free agent. Levante David, David Long, who I absolutely love from the Titans. I didn't know he was a free agent. Bobby Okereke, or Okariki, if you call his games in college. Uh, Jermaine Pratt, Eric Kendricks, who's a little bit old. Um, Leighton Van Der Esch, who's had some injury issues. But you know what I mean? He's like, also done some commercials names. with uh, Justin Herbert. Exactly. <laughs> like, those are flashy names that slot perhaps ahead of Drew. And now, you know, because of the market, you have an opportunity to keep your guys. Yep. Uh, we're a little short on time, so I'm going to try to combine some of these questions because okay. some of the... Uh, Sorry, I'll be less long-winded. No, it's, it's, it's not you. It's We, we have some, we have a lot of questions. It's great. Um, Luis, Andrew, Jeff, and Chris. I'm just going to kind of combine these. Assuming the Chargers re-signed Pipkins and cut Filer to slot Sawyer in a left guard, how do you think they address the backup swing tackle position? We kind of just alluded to that. Uh, what extensions could be done to keep the cap to help the cap and keep the team together. And then somebody asked about maybe offering extensions to Eck and Vato to help with cap relief. And if they don't draft a tight end in the first round, who would be your favorite targets in later rounds? Um, so a, a lot there about the offensive line. Would you like to build the offensive line through free agency or the draft? Um, Money, you can kind of attack this however you want. Maybe we should just start with, would you offer guys like, like Mike Davis and Eckler extensions to help with cap relief? Well, I mean, their number's so small right now. That's the thing. They're both bargains. You know, Mike is, what, $10 million bucks for a starting corner? I mean, that's nothing. Yeah. We're talking about guys that are making $25 bucks a year at that position, and I'm sure Mikey's content to be like, hey, man, either you're going to pay me a bunch of scratch or I am getting to free agency. So I think that's the one issue there is I don't think that's the place to find cap relief. The place to find cap relief is where – that to me, the the big one is Joey Bosa. It's thirty million bucks, you know, and you can you can toy with that as long as you're comfortable stretching Joey out, which I'm assuming they are. Um, you know, he seems to be a core piece, so I would guess that's one uh, that you'd want to take. That that that's a big one. Um, yes, plugging Jamari in at guard serves two purposes. One, you feel good about him. Two, Matt Filer saves you eight million bucks. It's just salary that's off the books. But, as Popper pointed out last week, you know, Jamari played tackle and, you know, yes, he played he played everything. He played up and down that Georgia line. You know, they kicked him inside when they needed him inside. They kicked him outside when they needed him outside. But that's projecting, okay, he's going to be a solid. I think he's going to be a better guard personally because once he locks onto you, that's where he wins. You know, it was some of the speed rushers that he kind of had trouble getting out to quickly. So, I think that's a solution there. Yeah, I said it. I think a tight end. Um, you saw all the athleticism out there. The, the one thing I would say about tight end, though, and trying to pick one up in the third, fourth, I think it was Porter Wright was the one that really kind of raised his hand out of Iowa. So the, the, or Laporta, yeah. So I just think it's such an important position. I think it really changes the math when, when you have a dominant player at that position. So to me, if you have one of those elite guys sitting there, um, to me, that... I would get it. I wouldn't mess around with, hey, let's see if we can pluck this guy in the third or fourth. They've been doing that since they let Hunter Henry go. You know, it's one year it's it's uh, it's Jared Cook. The next year it's Gerald Everett. Like, get that guy and get that position settled because, man, Justin is, he can exploit the hell out of it. Jack Foley says, I know Matt Money Smith is on the Kincaid train, but would the team take him over Mayer if both available at 21? Uh, the Chargers have, have a, a track record of liking those Notre Dame guys' money. They sure do. Um, I don't know. I, I think there's, you know, there's there's so many different styles. Uh, there's so many different types, body types, styles of play. I think it's just what they think fits the team best. Um, you know, do they want someone who's more of a blocker um, and not as good of a pass catcher? Then, yeah, then, then you know, Meyer might be your guy. Or Washington might be your guy, if that's what you want. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we said it. If you want someone at that position that's a little bit more of the Travis Kelsey, you know, I, I don't even want to put Evan Ingram in there. He's so much more of a wide receiver. He's not even really a, a tight end. Um, Kincaid is is a, a more Kelsey-esque style tight end. Um, 
So I think it just depends. I, I wouldn't have a problem with either of them, you know, with Washington, with Meyer, with with Kincaid. I'm good with all that, you know. Give me some of that for for her. But I just think you get those trees in the in the red zone in the middle of the field. It's such a it's such a it, it just it's easy completions to me when when you can find one of those guys. The likelihood the Chargers will trade down even out of the first round. You know, I, I think you got to get a blue chip type player uh, where you're at because of the fact that the quarterbacks are, are going to go there. But what do you, what do you think? Yeah, uh, to me, if, you know, we've, we've said it. It's just what, what, how many players do they have first round grades on, and is one of them available? And if that player isn't available, what is the offer? You know, that for someone that wants to come up, that clearly has one of those players as a, a first round grade. So that's again, that's just math. It's it, it really does typically come down to that and and whether or not you have a player that you really like and how big the gaps are on your horizontal board. You know, horizontal, you have each position and you have each position ranked and then you have a vertical, however many players they put on their vertical. Some teams put 70, some have 100, some have 150 in order. And what does that look like um, based on what's available to you? It doesn't sound, you know, it doesn't sound like there's a lot of action in this draft. I, I didn't quite get that vibe when I was out at the combine that there's going to be a lot of those teams that want to jump up now. If if what you say goes, Chris, and let's just say Hendon Hooker ends up going, that someone falls in love with him and he ends up going in the first round and you get five guys and now you've got 16 players, you know, you're the 16th best non-quarterback that you get to draft. Okay, now that looks like a back end of a first round grade and that's that tends to be the sweet spot. That's what you usually hear from guys is, yeah, it's usually about 17 to 20 guys that get first round grades on in an average draft. So now, yeah, you could be in a position to trade back because it may be the very back end of, okay, this guy we have, and he should have gone at 12, but the quarterbacks pushed him down and, oh my God, he's available at 21. Let's get him and offer him, you know, a two this year and a two and a three next year. And okay, let's go. You know, Chargers have no two, so replaces that or they lost their two last year so now you replace that two that you lost last year maybe and you get the extra pick out of it the following year a couple more and guys we get a bunch of pouring in so we we always appreciate you listening we'll do another one of these okay. very soon uh, uh bolts nine four i think we kind of answered this how, how do the chargers fix the running game i think it's a combination of a lot of things you, you, you either get that generational running back we he talked about a speed receiver in this question um, and then obviously upgrading the offensive line. But I also think the Kellen Moore scheme is going to help, 100%. right? Is going to help that running game. Uh, John Bingham money wants to know how and when did the chargers get a backup center who can take over in 2024? I guess he's looking for the next Corey Lindsley. I'm, I'm very happy with the current uh, setup, but uh, yeah. I, I, I appreciate the future question. You know, that's uh, just going back to a prior question, restructuring Vato or, or Austin. How about restructuring Corey? You know, I don't want to do center in 2024. I, I don't want either. Corey, you know, and he's he's doing great. So, I, and he's young enough that, you know, and centers tend to last a little bit longer than tackles. Um, so, I think that's an interesting contract to maybe extend because I would assume they want him here. Um, so, that's instead of finding the next one. Um, and, and I think the good thing about center is if, if we feel so, you know, if we feel really good about this nucleus that the Chargers have, you can you can get the best center in the draft typically in the 20s. You know, those those guys, you know, of all the positions on the offensive line, they tend to last the longest. They're the last ones that are drafted. Remember when they when the Cowboys took Travis Frederick, everybody freaked out. They're like, you're taking a center in the first round. And now it's commonplace where the number one center ends up going at the back end of the first round. So I think that's something you can replace um, if the Chargers stay competitive like we think they're going to. And their first round pick ends up in the 20s uh, somewhere every year. You know, and hopefully one year it ends up at 32. Um, then, yeah, I think that's still a, a good spot for a center. Last one. If Trey Pipkins does sign with another team, how high of a draft priority, a.k.a. what round, does right tackle become? So it, it's something we talked about with yeah. all the guys that you mentioned in the free agency market. Or do you, you know, spend a second, let's say, on a right tackle? Well, I think, or does Jamari Sawyer become your right tackle? And that now too. you're drafted interior lineman. You know, so that's the other thing is is if Trey leaves because J Jamari helps so much, you know, with that issue because he can play tackle or guard. So if Trey leaves and you're sitting at 21 and like you were last year with Zion, you feel like, oh, we're going to get, 
you know, the second best guard, you know, our number two graded interior lineman in the draft, and you plug him in at, at left guard um, and move Jamari over to right tackle, and you still have an opportunity to move on from Matt Filer's money if you want to do that. And I don't want to cut Matt Filer. I don't want to put him out of a job. You know, I think he had a little bit of a rough go last year, but he had a really good year the year prior mm-hmm. next to Slater. I think that's what people have to remember. Like, when it was Lindsey Filer, Slater, that was a really good left side of the line. And if you can get that to come back, then, yeah, that would be ideal. And you don't have to expend a, a pick there. Um, I think they're hoping that Brendan Hymas takes the step that, that Trey took this year, last year, that, that Hymas can take that step this year haven't drafted him where they did and he's got center guard flexibility and tackle flexibility for for that purpose um so that's that would be my guess is that their first goal would be in-house um and have that inexpensive option six round pick you know jamari at right tackle instead of having to hand out seven eight million bucks to somebody because trey's gone what do you have about this we went, we went 60 minutes on march 8th talking chargers football Pretty good. And a ton of questions. So yeah. people def- definitely engaged and intrigued by what the Chargers are going to do. Uh, but it's March Madness. you got to get to the United Center yeah. and, and talk, to, talk some Big Ten. Cover some Big Ten. Who are the games today? Today I've got the, uh, the basically like the plans, right? The buys start tomorrow. So today we've got uh, 11, 12, 13, 14. So it's Wisconsin. As hard as it is to believe, Wisconsin and Ohio State are the 12th and 13th teams yeah, used to be in the Big Ten. That's how stacked the Big Ten was this year. They're going to get 10 teams in the tournament. Uh, and then 11-14 is Nebraska, who, by the way, Nebraska, who's the 11th team, won six of their last eight games, swept Iowa, and they're playing a Minnesota team that's just really struggled this year. So um, should be – I mean, having Wisconsin-Ohio State in the play-ins, Chris, you're – you're a Northwestern uh, alumnus, so you know it's uh, usually Northwestern, yeah. Minnesota, Rutgers, uh, Penn State is typically what we get on this day. And today we're getting Ohio State, Wisconsin. It's just crazy to have those two teams. Or typically Nebraska is, is here, you know, and, and they're here this year again, but they're a really good team. So it's just kind of funny that we got Wisconsin and Ohio State. I think between them they have. I want to say they have seven Big Ten tournament titles between them, and they're playing as the 12 and 13 seed this year. Those Chris Collin Wildcats got to feed up today. They're relaxing. I think they're going. They're, they're the two they're seed. Dancing. <laughs> they are the two seed. They're opposite Purdue with the double bye. Uh, it's crazy, man. They're they're enjoying life. They're loving it, man. Unbelievable. Hey, man, enjoy yeah, Chicago. Good luck, to, uh, good luck to your cats. Yeah, you know what? I, I'm just glad they're going to get in, you know, and maybe maybe win a game or two. Hey, they got a good team, man. They're, they're backcourt. They they got two vets, you know, Boo Booey and Chase Adige. Those are good. Adige is one of the best defensive players in the Big Ten, and, and Boo Booey is one of the best all-around players in the Big Ten. And, you know, that's the old – you know, benefit of COVID. They stuck around an extra year. So you got guys that are like 24 years old out there roughing up these kids because it's Northwestern. And why not, man? Let's go have some fun and see if, you know, you can get the city of Chicago a Final Four appearance, you know? That'd be incredible. So going to be fun. All right, bud. Enjoy it. Uh, We'll talk next week. Uh, For money, I'm Chris. This has been Chargers Weekly. All right, guys, as the official hospitality provider of the NFL, On Location offers unrivaled access to experience all premier NFL events like never before. On Location brings you up close for all the action, providing fans with unforgettable moments from draft day to Super Bowl Sunday and everything in between. On Location thrilled to announce its new partnership with the Pro Football Hall of Fame. This August kickoff football season in Canton, Ohio, and be there live to witness the class of 2023 enshrinement. The NFL is headed back to London and Germany for the 2023 NFL International Games. On location, official packages will feature game tickets, deluxe hotel accommodations, private tours, pregame hospitality, end-to-end planning, and more. Be sure to secure your priority access today. Visit NFLOnLocation.com or search NFL On Location today. Your football experience of a lifetime awaits only with On Location. 